When you read in the scriptures about people who have found God, it doesn't stop there. It gets deeper and it gets more and more intense. It's a being drawn to a light. It is being, as you get closer and closer to that light, this tremendous almost like... Good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church's online virtual service. We're so happy that you're here with us. We're so honored and blessed to be able to bring these videos to you. Wherever you are, near or far, you are part of the Grace family. We pray that things in your life are going very well. And if you came in need of something today, just trust that God knows that. So join with us as we worship, sing loud, and just trust that in the Word, God will speak to you. Thank you so much for participating and supporting these videos. We're so happy that you're here. Welcome. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, I have no idea what it was like for Jesus to walk this earth, what he had to deal with. But what I appreciate is that he promised that the Holy Spirit, that the Comforter, would be what was left behind to help us. Father, every day we're going to fail, and you know that. You never stop forgiving us. The heart of love that you have. Sometimes I feel like, Father, when I come before you and I ask for forgiveness again, I know I feel like this time you're going to say no. Because how many times have I asked? And Father, that's just not how you work. I pray that your children would take comfort in this. First of all, that we're not alone, that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, just even in the name Comforter, we will receive the comfort that we need just to get through the next moment of whatever is going on in our life. And second of all, that that forgiveness will never run out. That is a well that will never run dry. Thank you so much, Father, for your promises and for your love and what Jesus' life and death meant for us and means for us now every day that we walk in this world. In his name we pray. Amen. Dead of night. 
Here we come again to that time where offering um, is part of our worship. Offering isn't just in the giving of money to a church or a Christian ministry. Offering is a sacrificial uh, thanksgiving to God. Not that God needs anything. He has said all over the scriptures. He's the owner and creator and sustainer of all things. It is for our benefit that offerings are given. It is. It's for ours. Because in the support of the church, the church of God, the church that supports the word of God, in that support, the lives of human beings, there's more chance of them being transformed. There's, no, there's more uh, opportunity for people to come and to hear the real truth of God. It's, it's nowhere else. It's not on TV. It's not, maybe there might be Christian programming here and there. But it's really the strategy of God from the get-go. Send out his people into the world to form fellowships called churches so that people may come together, work together to reach their fellow sinners with the tremendous great news that we all know. So let's pray for today's offering. How we thank you for the, the tremendous abilities that you've given us. How can we thank you anyway? Words pale, money, there's not enough. There's no sufficient amount of thanksgiving. The picture in Revelation is to fall down before your throne and cast down our golden crowns and give you thanks and praise and honor forever. That's it. We give you back everything you've given us. We pray that you would multiply it in our lives, in our loved ones' lives, and may the word of God flourish in us and extend out, like David the King said, my cup runneth over. Amen. Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And it's why I sing your praise
And you shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own You're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes Good morning. We have a treat for you today, and it's that we decided to um, record this episode uh, separately uh, because of a technical issue on Sunday. So this is the third time that I get to preach this sermon. So it should be three times as good as the first time. So hopefully you'll you'll uh, be blessed with this message because many people have been telling me that there's something about this that helps a lot. So that's my hope. That's my prayer for you and for myself and others that we can give message from the Word of God that encourages people to to go forward. Um, life is difficult, life is challenging, and without the Word of God, it would be almost hopeless. But there's tremendous hope in the promises of God, in the blessings of God. So in part five of the plans of God, the blessings of God upon my life, uh, the theme verse is out of Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I think that this is a tremendous glimmer of light in the midst of a book, the book of Jeremiah, that is a book of judgment against Israel in its um, heyday, so to speak, and God, through the prophet Jeremiah, was warning the people and warning them that they needed to turn their lives back around to the Word of God and listening to what God says, and they wouldn't listen. And finally, what resulted in the book of Jeremiah is everything that God said would happen through Jeremiah's prophecies happened. They lost their nation. They lost their economy. They lost their land holdings. They lost everything. And God, in the midst of all of this, he'll do this in scriptures. He'll send this tremendous like beam of light into darkness. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So let's pray as we think these things through. That you would think of us as an encouraging thought or truth. We are not just random accidents that came into being. You thought us before we existed, and we are now living our lives. They may not be the lives that we would have chosen to live, but you have ordained that we should be who we are, live when we live, and be in the circles that you have placed us in. Our families, our friends, our acquaintances, both inside the church and outside the church, at work, at home, at school. Help us, Lord, to see the purpose in our existence. 
Because once we understand that our life, our existence, is actually part of the plan of our God, and that your thinking towards us is a, ultimately it's a positive thinking. It's not positive thinking by itself, but it is you saying that there's reason for us. There is a plan for us. There is a future and a hope for us. These are in the scriptures. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to cut through all of the discouragement, all of the negative, um, even religious and human thinking and philosophies and religion, to get down to the simplicity of you and us, myself and you. I am here, and you are God. You are God, and my, I am yours, and you are mine. Help us, Lord, to walk in the path that you had put into our lives before we were ever born, and help us to find contentment in your plan for our lives, be they what they may be. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you remember from last week, we looked at the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is the uh, theologians will often title the, that passage, the blessings and the cursings from Mount Ebal, which was the elevated uh, mountain which uh, God spoke his blessings through Moses to the children of Israel who would go into the promised land. The first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28 are the promised blessings. We covered that last week, and it was, it is a very positive uh, message from the scriptures about what God says he can do for us. But then following that in Deuteronomy 28, there are 54 verses of judgment and consequence. So in order to be true to the admonition of scriptures that we should present the whole counsel of God, it's important, I think, to at least look at some of what God is saying in Deuteronomy about what happens when people don't listen to, um, to uh, the Lord and his word, okay? So we've got to listen to the negative part of what God tells us in scriptures, not just the cotton candy and the good stuff. Some people kind of get off on talking about love and forgiveness and heaven and everything's cool and everything's great and nobody wants to talk about what about the flip side what about the negative um, parts of scriptures which uh, people say i don't believe in that and they, they reject anything that sounds negative because they don't want to hear what god says about the behaviors that bring about negative consequence but they're there even apart from, if you will, religiosity, a word I don't like, even apart from that, just in everyday life, there is consequence. If I put my hand on a hot stove, I'll burn it. If I uh, fall off a cliff, I'll fall and hurt myself. If I crash my car into a wall, I'll hurt myself. So we need to see that there, just in regular life, that's a principle of existence. There is to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, okay? It's not that God is being negative. God is simply stating for us the obvious. When we listen to God, our lives will have a certain trajectory. When we don't listen to God, our lives have another trajectory, okay? It's not God's fault because God is always saying in the scriptures how to live rightly, He's, he warns us what happens when we don't live according to what he says. And because of our human nature and because it's all around us and people all around us and in culture all around us, and because it seems to be avant-garde in our day and age, we have decided that we can live however we want and that God still needs to love us no matter what we do and how we live. God does love you no matter what you have done or how you have lived. But God is not saying that he will bless you for your behaviors that are negative. He does say that if you live your life in, in opposition to what I reveal in the scriptures, then this is what will happen. And if you don't want to listen to that, <clears throat> then you're going to have a constant struggle against God and God's word. So here are some of the, the um, 
consequential, if you will, um, fruits of the lifestyles that we like to kind of glorify in our day and age. This is from Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. If you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, then all of these things will happen to you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Remember last week was blessed in the city, blessed in the country. Wherever you are, God will bless you. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed, meaning your career. The fruit of your womb will be cursed, that is, your family life. The crops of your land, the calves of your herd, um, that's, again, your industry and your, your business and all of the things that we set our hands to. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, rebuke, and everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the way you have lived your life in forsaking him and his word. Okay? So it goes on and on, and it goes on for 54 verses. Why? Why so? Uh, it seems almost like unbalanced. It's because God knows our propensity. He knows that the sin nature in humankind gravitates towards disobedience. So the warnings of Scripture are much more stringent about that. And he's the, the, the Scriptures that are reserved for the blessings, the forgiveness, the, the hope, the future, it seems like there's few verses that talk about it because our behaviors tend towards the disobedience and towards the negative lifestyles that bring about the consequences that bring ruin to our lives. Now, let's go on to the next point because I want to leave Deuteronomy and go on to this next area of asking for God's blessings and God's presence in our lives. God can bless you despite your personal family history. Many of us come from broken homes and broken marriages, and, and maybe you yourself came into this world and, and your family wasn't any family at all. I just uh, was able to meet with a, a person who had a, uh, a life experience that was like really, really a negative one from the get-go. And that has happened and continues to happen to many people because of the times that we live in. Now, God, even in spite of all of that, no matter what your history, your, your failures, your sins, your, your behaviors, no matter how bad it has been, be it Mary Magdalene or the thief on the cross, he can bless you in spite of all of that. He can bless you and he wants to bless you. So I'm going to show you something. Here's an account of a man who, in the 19, I think, 70s and 80s, David, David Wilkerson wrote a book called The Prayer of Jabez. It was real popular. And some people, like I said, they love to grab something out of the scriptures that is just the positive. And it took off. It became an, a really number one seller, kind of a really popular book. And I think that's because... People are desperate for good news. People really want to hear that God does want to bless us. And we find this in a little snapshot of a Jewish man that lived many, many, many years ago in 1 Chronicles 4. These are the history books of Israel. And um, this man is named Jabez. It says here in 1 Chronicles 4, 9, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. And so I put in parentheses here, Jabez, uh, when in research this, the name actually means pain, sorrow, suffering, man of suffering, man of sorrow. So because his mother had a really bad birth experience, physical birth experience with Jabez, she actually gave him the name pain or suffering. And it's kind of a, a negative story in a way, but there's a it starts out with a positive statement. Jabez, this guy that his mom named him Pain, he actually says, it says here, he was more honorable than his brothers. It doesn't say how, but it compares him against his brothers. He's in the family. His mom called him Pain. Hey, you Pain, come over here. You know how we are with kids and we make fun of each other and God is 
uh, into the humorous aspects of human behavior with Abraham and Sarah, for example. He names Isaac Isaac because when he tells Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a baby, and they've been hearing this since they were in their 40s. By the time it comes to fruition, Abraham's 100 and Sarah's in her 90s. And they're, they're like kind of, they both kind of snicker under their breath. And God says, why are you laughing? And he says, so, okay, so you're going to have to call him that. you got to call him Isaac. Because if you read the scriptures with the footnotes, it says Isaac means, in, in Hebrew, it means he laughs. He laughs at God. And God even said, why is she laughing? And Sarah says, I'm not laughing. But she was. And so did Abraham even. Everybody kind of snickered. It's like, yeah, right, I can't have babies at 100 years old. They didn't have any way to cause that to happen. It had to be a total supernatural miracle. But God allows the situation to name the kid. In this case, Jabez gets named. Hey, you, Payne, come over here. Can you imagine being Jabez, a little kid in the playground, and everybody says, hey, come over here, Payne. I'm going to give you some more pain. If you grew up as a little boy, you might know what I'm talking about. It's kind of a drag being given that kind of name. I grew up in the tail end of the 60s and early 70s, and all of the hippie culture were naming their kids all kinds of weird names like, oh, I'm going to name him Sky, and I'm going to name her, her uh, Willow, or I'm going to name her Snow Breeze, or whatever it is, these, these names that people made up. And so the poor kid, what's your name? Oh, my name's Snow Breeze. And it's like, you're just really handicapping that kid for the rest of their life. So... You need to try to be more sensitive about, quote-unquote, naming your kid. Scriptures say in Revelation that he will give you a new name, a name that is written on a stone for you. He'll call you what you really are. So Jabez is named Pain. But in spite of all of this, I say that God can bless you. You can still be an honorable man who loves God and follows God regardless of your family history, your family situation, whether there's conflict or, or whether there's a family dynamic that is negative for you, maybe you were abused, maybe you were um, not treated right or equitably in your mind. Many, many adults are still stuck because whatever happened 40 years ago when they were just little kids, it's still, you know, kind of dragging them back. It's like an anchor and they can't go forward. And all I can say about all of that is this. Whatever your family history, I'm not trying to minimize it. I recognize the fact that many human beings have suffered untold horrors and pains and suffering and abuses because of family and family history. I'm not minimizing that. I know it happens. I've met many people that it has happened to. I myself grew up in a human family. I've seen many things happen. All I can say is this. God can bless you no matter the circumstance or the background. So in the next point, you can change the narrative of your life. You yourself have been given by God the ability to redefine, if you will, the, the story of you. You can, because God is the God of the, of the new page, of the second chance. That's the kind of God we serve he knows all of our sins and failures. He knows them. He knows that we have this in our lives. But you can actually start changing the future of your life by calling out upon God. That's where the first step is. In spite of the family history and the background and the pain and the suffering, you can stay there and you can wallow in it, like the scriptures say, just stay stuck in it like quicksand. Or you can say, okay, whatever my life has been, all the stuff that I've lived and gone through, all of the pain, the suffering, the background, I'm going to be able to look at my life and say, okay, God, I'm going to call out to you. And Jabez does this. Look at First Chronicles 4, verse 10. So Jabez called out on the God of Israel. So there's the first step. Call upon the one true God. There is no other God than the God of Israel. This God is the God of creation. All of the other gods of all of the peoples were made up gods. This is the true God, the creator God, the sustainer God, the redeemer God, the God of promise, the God of reconciliation, the God of restoration and resurrection, the God of forgiveness, the God of power, the God of life and blessing. That's the God we're calling on. You can call on the God of Israel. You can say like he did, 
Oh, that you would bless me. There's a neat prayer. Start out that way. Our Father who art in heaven, oh, that you would bless me. Indeed, enlarge my territory. What's he asking for there? Give me more influence. I mean, they named me pain. Can you kind of change that so that my, my life touches people in a different way? So that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil. Deliver us from evil. That's in the Lord's Prayer, right? Deliver us from evil. So that I may not cause pain. The recognition of sin is all around me. It's in my family. It's in my brothers, my mom, my dad. It's in me. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be part of this problem anymore. I want to be part of the solution to this problem. I want to be the kind of a person that doesn't cause pain. Then it says this, so God granted him what he requested. There is the prayer of Jabez. That's it. Two verses, the prayer of Jabez. So God can bless you no matter what your history, but you can change your history and the narrative of your life by simply stopping and saying, okay, God, here's my train wreck. Here's my life, the thief on the cross. Here I am. I'm dying. I cry out to you. So we do that, and it changes the very future of your eternal trajectory. Okay, it's pretty an amazing, cool thing to see. Next, when you ask the Lord, if you want the blessings of the Lord like Jabez, oh, that you would bless me. When you ask him, you need to ask with expectation. Expectation is the, the understanding that God will and can give to you what you ask for and beyond what you ask for. Just to show you an account of this with Elisha the prophet, who was getting old, and it says here in 2 Kings 13, 14, Elisha was sick with the illness by which he would die. So stop there before we go on. This is a little aside. Elisha was a prophet of God. He took over from Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of Israel. And um, he was getting old, and it says here in the scriptures, very matter-of-factly, he got sick with the illness by which he would die. It doesn't say what it was. Was it cancer, high blood pressure? Who knows what it was? He was getting old, and he was getting sick, and he was going to die. That is a reality that all of us have to face. God doesn't always heal you and restore you to health. Eventually, there is an illness by which you will die. Okay, and if the illness doesn't get you, old age will get you. And if old age doesn't get you, the illness will get you. So whatever, either way, we're all going to face this fact. The Bible says in scriptures, it is appointed unto man to die once. After that, you meet God. Joash, the king of Israel, came and wept over him, saying, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So what's going on here? What's this king, king uh, of Israel named Joash? If you read the history of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, they actually had a civil war and they did divide, unlike the American civil war. They actually did divide. There was a northern Israel and there was a southern Israel. Actually, southern Israel was truer to God than northern Israel, but eventually they both kind of ended up in the same place. Northern Israel got so out of whack that when the Bible describes every single political leader that they had since the death of Solomon, not one of them is ever described in the scriptures as a righteous king. In Judah, the southern kingdom, different kings got described as either wicked or good. But in the northern kingdom, not one king got given the title of this was a good king. But this man, at least one of them, recognized Elisha. He did recognize him as the prophet of God. So he comes and he hears Elisha's going to die. So he goes as king and he goes to Elisha, the prophet, the, the speaker of God's word to the people of Israel. And he cries out, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Why? Because when Elisha took over from Elijah to become prophet of Israel, he told Elisha before he ascended into heaven, Elisha asked Elisha, there's two different names here, Elijah and Elisha. He asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And Elisha tells Elijah, I want double the blessing that you have had on your life. And he goes, well, if you see me leave, 
and maybe you'll have it. And sure enough, chariots come down from heaven, the spirit realm of God, pick up Elijah bodily and take him away. And Elisha sees it and he cries out, the, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So that was the beginning of the prophetic ministry of Elisha. And the king of Israel, northern kingdom, he recognizes Elisha and he cries out to him, knowing that this man who speaks the word of God is going to die. And it's a loss. It's a loss when a man or a woman or anyone who loves God, when they actually check out of this world and go into eternity. It is a loss because we do benefit from the great teachers and preachers and evangelists of our history. We do. We benefit from them. We have been bettered by their admonitions, by their preaching, by their teaching, by their evangelism, whether it's Billy Graham, whether it's Moses, whether it's David the King or Samuel or whoever you want to point to in history, Moody or any other person like that. There is a tremendous loss when somebody of great uh, ability with God and God's word goes away because then we're, like it says about Israel, there was a time when there was no prophet and the word of God was scarce. When you have somebody who preaches and teaches and shares the word of God in an authoritative and a clear, concise way, that is a gift. So this man, Elisha, is about to die. So he, I think the king does recognize that, wow, you know what? We're in trouble if this guy dies. So he goes up to Elisha and Elisha tells him, take a bow and some arrows. Here's a prophet, and he tells the king what to do. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. So here's a neat picture. You see political leadership partnering with spiritual leadership, and because of that, something positive is going to come out. When we have political social leadership in any realm, okay, whether it's ancient Israel or modern-day America or Europe or anywhere in the world, when you see the political leadership decide, I don't need the spiritual side of things, then you're going, to have, you're going to have misery with the people. But when there's a partnership between the leadership of God and the leadership of politics, blessings come. So he says, take a bow. So he does this. And he said to the king of Israel, the prophet tells the king, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on the bow. And then Elisha put his hand on the king's hands on the bow. Then he says, now open the window. So he opens it. So this is all to show you an account of something really cool. So Elisha, the prophet, tells the king, shoot the arrow. So he shoots the arrow. Then he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, the arrow of deliverance from Syria. Syria was the, the um, if you will, the neighborhood bully that was always oppressing and militarily striking and attacking Israel. And so... Um, God tells this king of Israel through the prophet that the deliverance of Syria is going to come. You must strike the Syrians at Aphek, that was one of their, their major towns, until you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took the arrows. The, the prophet tells the king, strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. Then it says, the man of God was very angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. When God tells you to do something, do it all the way. Do it with expectation. Strike the ground, and you should have done it six or seven times or however many times, and then you would have struck them until you had destroyed them. But now you'll only succeed. You'll only strike them three times, and they're not going to be destroyed because of that. So there was no expectation. He understood that this man was a prophet. He understood that this man carried the favor and the blessing of God, but he did not totally avail himself to it. He withheld, and the prophet actually showed some impatience. Jesus did this with the disciples a few times. Um, one time when um, he, he appears after his resurrection, he asks them, where is your faith? Or during his earthly ministry, he asks them, where is your faith? What's wrong with you guys? How come you don't see this? Come on. He, he, we see this almost frustration from God's side. Even the angels, they, in the resurrection, they would ask the people who came to the tomb, don't you remember? He told you this. Come on. What's up with you guys? Where is your faith? Where is the expectation of the belief in what God and God's word says? And we need to see this because it is our tendency as sinners, all of us are sinners, 
to have a doubting attitude towards God, God's promises, God's abilities. So the next point is that our agnosticism and our unbelief, that's what keeps us from spiritual blessing. It actually keeps us in spiritual bondage. It is agnosticism and unbelief. That's another word for atheism. Those are the prevalent viewpoints across the planet nowadays. People are more apt to confess openly and publicly, oh, I'm an agnostic, I don't know. Oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe there's a God. They're willing to totally confess that openly and publicly as if it is the most um, amazing, stup stupendous, and uh, advanced thing to say, but yet it simply is an indication of our culture and our time fulfilling all of the biblical prophecies of the great backsliding away from faith in God. But agnosticism and unbelief and atheism keeps you from spiritual blessing. It actually keeps you under bondage. So look, look over at Mark 9, verse 20. They brought to him, they brought him to Jesus. So stop there. Here's what's going on, just to set the context. Jesus had been on the Mount of Configuration, Transfiguration with Peter, John, and James. He showed himself with Moses and Elijah the prophet and revealed himself as he really is, with brilliant clothing, uh, emanating light. And Peter, James, and John were wowed by that. And while they're doing this, a man, another Israeli man, comes with his boy to the other disciples who stayed behind, and he asks them to pray for his son. They couldn't do anything with this kid, so they bring this kid to Jesus. And it says then, picking up the story, when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. There's a lot in this. The spirit realm knows who God is. They recognize him. They are terrified of him because God is the creator and sustainer of all things. Seen, when the Bible says seen and unseen, it means the physical realms that we can look at with telescopes and everything, and the, the spiritual realm that you can't see with telescopes or microscopes. But he is the creator and sustainer of all of that. They know, the demons and the angels know. So they, they recognize Jesus, and fell through this kid to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Now, in our modern-day parlance, we would actually psychoanalyze this kid and we would say, oh, he's got bipolar, you know, multiple personality disorder, or he's got this or that, so give him medication and give him this or give him that. Now, I am not minimizing the fact that many people actually have legitimate mental problems or mental, if you will, illnesses. I grew up with it in my family. I have a fully schizophrenic brother who was diagnosed that way, and it started to really manifest itself in his 20s and mid-20s and 30s. It got worse and worse and worse. But I will tell you this, having lived with it and seen it and experienced it, that it does have aspects of demonic possession. It does. Throwing him down, rolling around on the dirt, foaming at the mouth. Those aren't just um, psychological uh, symptoms to be looked at and treated without, without God. That culture understood that this was demonic. The Bible talks about this a lot. There are real demons. That's what's, that's what's happening all around us. So many people being oppressed and possessed and harassed by demons because the Bible teaches about the last times that the demons themselves and Satan would become totally active because they know their time is short. That's why we're having so much trouble, suicides, murder, hate, violence, racism, all of the things that are negative going on, and they seem to be escalating, not diminishing. Even though the world is getting more and more wealthy, more and more so-called advanced with technology, it's still as if human problems continue to go into an escalation curve. So Jesus asks the boy's father, how long has this been? Has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. So what we see here is here's a family, a Jewish family, a father and a kid. And there's probably other kids too. Maybe they were too afraid to have another kid. You know, I don't know. But everybody's impacted. The father's impacted. 
the, the rest of his family's impacted, the other Jewish people have now been pulled into this. When somebody's sick, it's come, kind of like a giant whirlpool. Everybody's being pulled into what's wrong with this, what's wrong? There's suicidal thoughts, there's self-destruction thoughts, it's all demonic. Then he says this, but if you can do anything, I underlined it for you, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Stop. So this is the man's response to Jesus asking him, how long has this been going on? And then we see this, if you can do anything. So Jesus' response, I underlined this as well, if you can. There's some neat, neat studies about this in the scriptures. If you were to isolate every question that God asked humankind, it would be a revelation to you. One of the first questions he asked mankind is, Adam, where are you? One of the first questions. Second one, after Adam responded is, who told you? God's questions to you and to me. When Jesus asks you a question, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. So his counteraction to the negative comment of if God can. That's the way we treat God. Think about it. When you ask God, do you ask like, well, God, you know what? Your last resort, I tried everything else. Maybe you can help me. Maybe, if I can. Don't you know who you're talking to? I'm the one that designed everything. I have all power. The sun burns at my command. The black hole at the middle of the Milky Way is there because of me. The whole universe is there because of me. All of the structures of molecules and elements, it's all there because of me. And then there's the spirit realm. There's life. There's beauty. There's all of these things. It's all because of me. Do you know who I am? If I can, all things are possible to him who believes. He talks about this all over the scriptures. There's so many instances of this. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, so here's the, the proper repentant um, response. I do believe in you, God. I really do believe, but help me overcome my atheism, my agnosticism, my doubt, my cynicism. Help me to overcome it. In other words, the recognition that inside of us all is this tremendous doubt, this tremendous negativity towards God. You must ask God to help you to be delivered from that atheism and that unbelief and that agnosticism because it will keep you in spiritual bondage just like this kid. He drives out the demon. He drives out the demon. And then they ask him, the disciples later ask him, why couldn't we drive it out? This kind only comes out by fasting and prayer, said Jesus. So there's so much in the scriptures about what we can do as human beings with the Lord and the power of the word and life itself. I am finding out that there's a whole teaching now concerning fasting and intermittent fasting about helping you to get your body into a more healthy state of being. There's all kinds of, inf the, the internet is a really, really cool resource center. It's like having a giant library right at your fingertips. Use it. There is lots, not, not everything on there is, to be trusted, you need to fact check, but nevertheless, you can study things, you can find out things, you can research things. You should become an expert about whatever particular problem you're dealing with. When you do, you can take action against those things. That's what the Bible's all about, giving us the right information so that we can take the right actions towards faith and life and a solution to the problems of life. Faith is an absolute certainty in God's existence and his ability. When we talk about faith and belief, help me overcome my unbelief, help me to have faith, like the disciples said, oh Lord, increase our faith. How, what is faith? Do I have to go look at Webster's Dictionary to find out what faith is, or maybe Wikipedia? Well, the Bible gives you a definition. The Bible answers itself. The answers to the Bible are in the Bible. So here's the definition, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the sub substance of things that you hope for. What do you hope for? Do you hope for forgiveness? Or is, is hope the word hope in an English word? Does it mean, I hope so? <laughs> I really hope so. Or is hope a different word entirely? 
In the King James, it is a certainty. It's the substance of things hoped for. It is certainty. It is the evidence of things not seen. I don't see God right now on his throne, but I know he's there. Do you? I don't see the angels. I know they're there. I don't see the demons, but all I have to do is open the newspaper. The evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance and the hope of all of that. That's what the Bible says faith is. Now, Hebrews 11 is called the hall of faith in the Bible. It gives you the example of Noah, of Moses, of David, of Solomon, of Daniel, etc., 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 of Abraham, of Sarah. Faith gives you the examples in that chapter. But it, then it actually gives you a little bit more here in Hebrews 11, 6. Without this thing called faith that is defined in Hebrews 11, 1, without that, without an absolute certainty in God's existence and God's ability, it is impossible to please God. You cannot have a relationship with somebody that you doubt. You cannot have a dynamic, powerful interaction with the Almighty with agnosticism and atheism. You can't. I have never met an agnostic or an atheist who lives in faith. It's the opposite with them. And it seems to become more and more rampant all around the world in our academic systems, in our colleges, in our graduate schools, in our public schools, in our culture, in our politics, all around us, it seems to me that atheism has become the world religion. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. There is the antithesis to atheism. It is the exact opposite of, the, of what the world is teaching and holding to. You must believe that he exists. Well, I don't, and there's scientific proof that he doesn't. You and your science. You are an ostrich sticking your head in the sand. The lion is charging. You can stick your head in the sand all day long. It's not going to stop the existence of God. And that he rewards those who diligently seek him. There's something about this seeking God thing that I have a tremendous conviction about. I am approaching my mid-60s now. I know I have found him. He has found me. I wasn't really looking for him, but I did find him, and he found me. I give him the credit, not me. It wasn't my intelligent intelligence. It wasn't my pedigree or my background or my family history. I was content to live life without God, but he found me. And now I know him. Now I know who he is. And when you read in the scriptures about people who have found God, it doesn't stop there. It gets deeper and it gets more and more intense. It's a being drawn to a light. It is being, as you get closer and closer to that light, this tremendous, almost like nakedness, this tremendous, like, wow, this, this being, this, this, person called God. Oh, you start falling down on your face. You start realizing that take off your shoes. This is holy ground. You start understanding that this is the most important of all pursuits. He rewards those who diligently seek. Do you know why Moses is Moses in the Bible? Moses is Moses because the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that he forsook the riches and the fame and the fortune of Egypt in exchange for him who is much more valuable than all of that. He forsook all of that and he began to seek God. And because of that seeking of God, he fell out of favor with Egyptian leadership and he got banished. He goes into the backwoods, into the desert, and he becomes a shepherd of smelly animals called sheep. And in this searching for God, years get spent in the backside of a desert and then he starts seeing a light off in a mountain, and he finds out that that's where God's mountain is. They call it God's mountain. So he goes, I'm going to go check it out. So he goes, and he keeps seeking, keeps seeking, and that's where he finds the burning bush. And from that burning bush, the first words are, Moses, Moses, take off thy shoes, take off thy sandals, for this ground is holy I have heard the cry of my people in Egypt, and I have come down to deliver them. 
So this seeking of God is something that isn't just for Moses. It isn't just for Daniel or Elijah or Elisha or Jesus or Peter or John. It's for anyone who wants to seek. You need to seek him. You need to search for him. You need to make it a diligent pursuit of your life. There is nothing like it. There is no other relationship that you can compare to it. Marriage, um, friendship, um, the right crowd, getting around this influential person or that one. You can. You could get around Bill, Gra- Bill Gates or any of these other zillionaires, billionaires, whoever they are. I forget all of their names. It doesn't matter. I'd rather have one iota of faith with God than all of the billions of the richest in this world because if they have all of that wealth but have no knowledge of God, they are the poorest people that I know. So I think that this seeking of God, the diligent seeking of God is necessary for every human being. We tend to expect that the teacher, the preacher, the evangelist, they're the ones that need to follow God. The guy with the robes, The priest, the guy up front, they're the ones that need to follow God. I'll just sit here and watch. That's not it. God's calling you out of your seat. Stop bench warming. Stop pew warming. Get out and start following him. Diligently seek him. Find him. Well, what if my friends don't like me? What if my family doesn't like me? What if nobody likes that I'm following God? So what? So what? The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all things will follow The blessings of God will come to you if you put him in first place. Thou shalt have no other God before me. The Lord expects us to believe and to ask. It is an expectation. Look what it says in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. If you're seeking God, and if you're asking like, oh God, I hope, maybe you can, how far do you think that'll get you? The Lord is expecting us to come and to ask. It's a neat admonition. Ask. Go ahead and ask God. It took me a long time to get to this place in my life where I said, God, I need, I need more money. I need a bigger house. I need this. I need this for my family, for my kids. But you do it within the context of him first. And in asking him, he'll give to you because look what he says next. God gives generously. He gives generously and with wisdom to anyone. In verse 9, what man amongst you, if his son asks for bread, will give his son or daughter a stone? So your kid asks, hey, dad, give me a, give me some cereal or give me some Fruit Loops or whatever. Fruit Loops, you shouldn't give them that. That's full of sugar, by the way. It's really poisonous for you. That's one of the things that I'm finding out where we've been brainwashed into giving some really bad kinds of stuff to even to our little kids. If you care about them, feed them right. If he asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? If you then, being evil, so the Bible, no, the Bible says it the way it really is, you're sinful, and you who are sinful, you actually know how to give good things to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give you good things if you ask him? It doesn't mean that God is a great uh, Buddha in the sky, rub the belly and here are your three wishes or rub the genie's bottle and here comes the genie and gives you your wishes. That's not it. God isn't a genie. God is God. Our Father in heaven is our Father. And if you ask him with the right motives and the right attitude, he will give you what you need. He may not give you everything you want, just like a kid. Dad, I want... I want candy in the morning and candy for lunch and candy for dinner. You're not going to do that because you know it's not good for them. So you have to ask within the right context. Now, confidence in God's promises brings assurance into your life. That's the only thing that has sustained me over all of these years of being a Christian. Not being a pastor, being a Christian. Things have happened in my life that seem to be, in a human perspective, all... uh, uh, On a human perspective, it looks like total loss, total discouragement. 
the death of a 22-year-old son, firstborn, or the death of two brothers younger than me, or the death of my father uh, when I first came out here. A year after I came, dead, boom, cancer. Then a few years later, my sister, boom, dead. My nephew hung himself. All of these negative things that have happened in my life, in my family, in my immediate family, in my extended family, looks like a total loss. But it is the promises of God that bring assurance in your life. Bible says, he who believes in me, even if he dies, he shall live. These promises are what give me tremendous hope that death isn't the end of it all, that sickness and accident and even suicide and sin, it's not going to stop God and God's blessing. The promises of God have overcome death itself. I have ultimate optimism, not because I am optimistic, but because God is who he is. Look what it says in James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He's not looking for favorites. I'll give Jimmy over here because he's really, really a good guy. That's not it. Whoever you are, thief on the cross, Mary Magdalene, John, Peter, whoever, whoever, Moses, whoever, you ask of him, he'll give to you. Solomon, he takes over the kingship from his dad. He says, to God in prayer, Lord, I don't know how to run a whole country. Can you give me wisdom? And God tells him, because you haven't asked for wealth or riches or the death of your enemies, but because you have asked for wisdom, I will give you wisdom such as no man has ever had. And I'll give you wealth on top of that. And that's exactly what happened with Solomon. Ask and it will be given him. Ask in faith not with wavering. For if you waver, you're like a wave of the sea driven with a wind and tossed back and forth. For let not that man or woman think that we will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man or woman is unstable in all of their ways. You guys get this? In asking, you must ask with total confidence and assurance. And when you have this tremendous assurance it brings you a sense of peace a sense of security a sense of standing on solid ground i want to encourage you in that contentment with where you are will help you get to where you would like to be hebrews 13 5 says let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he has said, I will never leave thee or nor forsake thee. What this means in modern English is that your life, your conversation, let your conversation, your life be without covetousness. In other words, you're never content. You're never satisfied with what God has given you. Whatever set of giftedness you have, abilities that you have, intellect that you have, we're, we're never content. We want more and more and more. And so we're always kind of like a, a whiny, bratty kid. Learn contentment. The, Paul the Apostle says, I have learned the secret of contentment. That is to be satisfied with whatever you have, wherever you are, at whatever time of life you live in. No matter what's going on, be content. If I have a lot, I'm content, said Paul. If I have a little, I'm content. Because God is the greatest wealth that I have. That no matter what I have or what I don't have, I have God. Ultimately, the greatest blessing of all is God himself. Genesis 15, 1. There's a neat promise. The word of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, means Yahweh. The word of Yahweh came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I, I God, am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. The principle that God is the ultimate blessing. The very person and presence of God in your life is better than wealth and stuff and everything else. Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The secret to life isn't to grab it's to let go and to put God first. For what profits it a man if you gain the whole world? You get all of the stuff, you get all of the wealth and form and fame and fortune, but you lose your soul. What will a man give in exchange for your soul? 
The Son of Man will come. God is coming back. He's going to straighten this whole mess out. It's not going to be fixed in the next election. It's not going to be fixed in the next century or thousand years or new age or new world order or new economic system. None of that is going to fix it. The only fix is the arrival of the Creator to come back to His creation and renew all things. The Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. He's coming to fix it all. But you don't have to wait till then. You can be part of it now. Have you asked Him to come into your life? Have you beseeched Him to be the blessing of your life? Or are you still there doing this number about God? I challenge the atheism and the agnosticism out there. I confront it as God does. I confront it. It's a dead-end street. There's nothing there. There's a blank wall. But at the end of God's street is eternal life, blessing, happiness, joy forevermore. Almost sounds like a fairy tale, but it's not. Lord, thank you for your word, which teaches us such tremendous truths. There's nothing else like the word of God. There's the word of man. There's the books written by men and women and religions and philosophies and cultures. But there's nothing like you and your word. Ultimately, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and demonstrated to us the amazing humility of our God. Thank you. Help us to approach the burning bush. For us, it's the cross. Help us to approach the King of glory, who for the love of sinners gave his life, investing in that which he considers to be the greatest resource, the souls of men and women and children. Help us to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for being a part of this Sunday's virtual service at Grace Community Church. You are our family. We pray that your week is very blessed. We hope you like this video and that you share it with your friends and family. Click like, subscribe, and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you.